Thank you very much. And, uh, Darius James. something that couldn't have been done outside of this pond. You know, I mean, no one in uh, the Hollywood generation or in finance or something like this today. Uh, in fact, at the time, I believe people could not deal with it honestly. You know, both in terms of social mentioned something uh, as we were coming down. You said that on the credits last night when we saw heavy traffic and tonight, most of those animators aren't around with us anymore. Can you talk a little bit about the who worked on this film? Right? I mean, I mean, this, uh, what, and I want to say something. Like One of the people on the film that's credited is this guy named Andy Palawoda. And he worked on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I understand that he did Simple Savior. Is that right? And and tell us, like these guys are the same guys that made Bugs Bunny and Snow White, right? To talk a little bit about who worked on this film. Well, first of all, the that's a great question because the guys that worked on this film were the guys that supported me. You know, old school animators of which I am. Um, you know, use pencil tests, and they worked for Warner Brothers and then Jen. They knew what they were doing. By the time they worked for the animation was collapsing, and all the studios they worked for were um, had shut down. So I was able to pick up. This is hard to believe in today's great cartoon market, where everything's exploding. Um, these guys were out of work. These guys were looking for jobs, and I came in with uh, heavy traffic and Fritz and hired them. And a lot of them did not want, some of them, not a lot, some of them did not want to work with, on this kind of stuff. But the guys that came with me were the really great guys. Andy quit Disney, he came over to me screaming angry. He was a hot hit, he was brilliant. But he used to animate for them, and they never gave him credit. They called him assistant animator. They, he animated all the time, but they never gave him credit. He came over, and the guys that stood behind me were just brilliant men. We had no pencil test. It may be hard to believe. I used to storyboard um, at my desk and find me would stop watching, give it to my layout man, and find the layout from checking and give them to the animators. But these guys were so good, I had nothing to worry about. By the way, they were so professional. I would flip the scenes. And you know, after a while, you get, you get used to what you're flipping. And if I thought it was OK, I gave it to um, he could paint. Now these guys were, this film was done without a pencil test, but you're looking at it's first time animation. Right off the guy's desk, at 30 feet a week. The budget in the studio was 30 feet a week. The budget of the film was about a million dollars or under. That's for everything, the shooting, the live action, my salary, my secretary. So uh, that's the kind of guys they were. These guys are all dead because they got old. I'm the last guy standing, because I was a kid. When I hired them, they were about my age, a little younger, when I hired them. Without them, I wouldn't have made these films. I couldn't have done it. it would have, I don't, I'm not looking for slick animation, but I'm looking for animation that tells the story. And these guys were, I can't say enough about these guys, how great they are. And 
I'm doing a picture today called The Last Day of the Coney Island, my last film. And uh, every one of these guys gets credit on this film. As long as I'm alive, every film I'll do, they're going up again on their credits, even though. Because I wouldn't be here if they didn't do what they did. Plus, some new animators. I got two Brooklyn animators on this film a Colleen Cox and a Mark Phillips. Are they here? Are they here tonight? Yeah. Oh, man. Stand up, you guys. Stand up. Other than that, so on these question about these, I can't, and these were professional men. Irv Spence used to come in in the morning about two o'clock, his work was finished. Every Friday he made 30, 35 feet of beautiful animation. There was no pressure on the studio. Um, these guys backed me, they loved what I was doing. They, they laughed their heads off, they couldn't believe it. At last they were free. I mean, they used to come to my office and say, Ralph, or sitting in the doorway, Ralph, you really want me to do this? Yeah. If you really, really want me to do this, I say, yeah. Thank God. You ran away. <laughs> Ralph, who's your fastest animator? Spence. 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 Ambie was the slowest, but he was the greatest. He did the Disney kind of simple save of me. Virgil Ross wasn't bad. And I would say Spence and, and Manny Perez. Really? Manny Perez. It was her. You couldn't touch her. You know. um, my question has to do. <clears throat> But I have to open up with this one question. Uh, you directed the uh, early Spider-Man cartoons. <laughs> in, in the mid to late 60s. And it was just rumor, rumor I heard, and I want you to confirm whether or not this rumor is true. The baseline on Spider-Man. Was that played by Charles Mingus? No, I don't have no idea. <laughs> you have to understand, I was trying to get 20 minutes a week done, right, on a $12,000 budget. And all I was doing was I was in the camera room, okay? And, every, and the films were short. If you're, uh, you've got to send it to the network, you know, at a certain length. So all I kept doing was adding Spider-Man swings. I was <laughs> he, this guy, I said, get the, I had a stack of swings and swing background. And every time it was short, the camera would sit there shooting swings. And we do swings and we play music. I don't know. Well, the Vegas was there or not, I don't know. I, I, I understand he was picking up like session I don't think so. I would if Minkus was there, I would have been there with him. <laughs> I love Charles Minkus. You know, so what I'm saying is, no, Minkus wasn't there. I know he was there. He's not gonna, I mean, where would he be? <laughs> I'm not putting him down if he was there. I'm just saying that if he was there, I, I would have known. Yeah. Unless he looks like somebody else. That wasn't the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm interested in, okay, first of all, um, almost from the beginning of American animation, there has been this relationship between jazz and animation. This film speaks in a distinctly black voice on several levels, you know, musically, language-wise, story-wise. Okay, and I want to know how.
how jazz came to influence the shape of American cartoon, uh, animated American cartoon animation. And if you can enlighten I'll, I'll try. Uh, well, I don't want too much. I'm not a historian. Ami can answer that question better than I could. Um, jazz, to me, in, in the 50s and 60s and so forth, was everything. Uh, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, uh, Chet Baker, Jerry Mulligan. I could go on and on. I don't want to, you know, the modern jazz quartet. I listened to it. I loved it. And it inspired me. Um, the first jazz records I heard were Miles Davis in the early 60s. Uh, he did this French film called The Escalator. Or es the Escalator. And he did it directly to picture improvisation. He just walked it in and culture and a bunch of his guys and played directly to the film. When you hear the music, you cry. So if you, maybe one of the best things